introduce to you our special speaker tonight, uh, Brother Dave Barker. You know him? I'm giving him a break, and that's why I'm leading the songs and the service tonight, so that he can be totally focused on the message that God has laid upon his heart. And I know it's a good one, and I'm looking forward to sitting and hearing what God has given to him. So, Brother Dave, you come. Good evening, everyone. I would say good to see you, but honestly, I can't. Um, so maybe good for you to see me. It's going to be my first time speaking to the camera and a few individuals here. So I apologize if I uh, kind of get a little confused mentally, but I will try to stay uh, focused. So tonight, I just want to share... Um, really from a passage that was very beneficial to me during this time of uh, quarantine, being stuck in the house, and uh, want to encourage you with what God has put upon my heart, and he's kind of repeatedly uh, shown me some of the same truths over and over again. It's something I was able to share with some of the men um, just this past Saturday with Men's Breakfast. And just something that God has continuously been pointing out in various passages, not just in this one. So um, I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and go to the book of Joel. The book of Joel. Um, if you're not familiar with where that is, it's a little bit after Isaiah and Jeremiah, those bigger prophets. And then you'll keep going a little bit and you find Joel. If you want, you can go to Joel chapter 2. That's where our, uh, the main uh, thrust of the message will be centered, is right there in Joel chapter 2. I have a feeling there are quite a few people uh, either tuning in and watching uh, or even here that have never read the book of Joel. And as you know, with ever hearing me speak, I definitely encourage people to read that unknown territory of the scriptures uh, in the Old Testament and near the that first bigger section of their Bible and then the group of prophets. And people so often skip through those and neglect them. They hit a few, but uh, I want to encourage you to spend time throughout all of God's word and Prophets are so, so full of great truths that apply to us uh, today. It's not just for uh, the people at the time the prophet spoke, but it's for us even today. And we can uh, read through and see what God wants to do in our hearts even now. So if you've never read this minor prophet, minor because it's smaller, uh, if you've never read this one, I would encourage you to sit down and read through it. Uh, obviously not right now, because that would, you know, kind of neg negate listening to what God has for us now. But tomorrow, so forth, it's a small one. It's only three chapters. You can make it through very quickly. So here in Joel chapter 2, interesting, the name Joel actually means Yahweh is God. So even from his name, we're looking at the fact that he alone is God. He is the one true God. There aren't other gods. There aren't, uh, you know, a lot of times in the world, people who believe in different religions will say, oh, you have that, you have that, but it's all the same God. It's not. That's not true. That's definitely a lie of the devil. We are not all worshiping the same God. Uh, there is only one God, and Yahweh is God. Uh, so even in his name, it is pointing to the fact that he alone, Yahweh alone, is God. Here in chapter 2, Joel is proclaiming the word of God about judgment coming upon the people. Now, in chapter 1, once again, there was judgment being pronounced on the people. Different locusts, different worms coming through as you see, you know, it, it causes canker worm and uh, the caterpillar. It's different kinds of locusts coming through and eating everything, devastating the land, ripping everything to shreds, 
There is nothing left. You know, that's often when God gets our attention. You know, uh, even Pedro sent, sent a, a, a thought to me, I believe it was yesterday, and pointing out it, it, it's often during those hard times, difficult times, God has to use that to get our attention because we're so focused on ourselves. We're so fine living the life the way it is, having ease, having pleasure, that we could kind of care less about God. It's only when that trouble comes that's when we need God. Unfortunately, some of the times when we are in the trouble and we want God, it's not that we actually want God. We just want the trouble to go away. Here we are in a very real situation, present day of trouble. It's, it's a difficult time. Some people are sick. Some people have family members that are sick. Some have experienced heartache by losing a loved one. We're inside our homes. Maybe we aren't working. We've lost a job. Uh, maybe we're on furlough. Maybe we're not sure what's going on. We are present day in a difficult time, and we want help. We want deliverance. Hopefully, our hope for deliverance is God alone. But once again, hopefully our desire for God to fix the problem isn't just so the problem goes away and we can get back to living life the way we want it. How horrible that will be if things progress and in the future we get back to a normal life, but we go back to living the way we did before without God. Sweet. Thank you, Lord. You solved the problem if we even say thanks for that. Now that the problem's gone, I'm going to keep going and, and keep living for myself. But hey, thank you very much for the uh, benefit of taking care of this situation and getting us back to normal. That is not the crying out to God that he desires to hear from us. He doesn't just want to come in, sweep down, fix the problems, and then us walk away. His desire through this devastation, this heartache, this pain, is to actually get our attention, get our hearts, so that we seek and crave God. That our desire is not for a problem to be fixed, but our, our desire is for God himself. Whether the problem goes away or not, we find God. And so the first chapter has given Complete devastation, uh, you know, here's, here's what's going to happen. It's going to ruin everything. You come to chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. The day of the Lord, time of judgment. Here in verse 2, it's a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. As the morning uh, spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong people, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. It's describing a great people that God would use to um, come in and destroy. And when you read about this, great people, this army, it says in verse 3, a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. Wow, what a beautiful picture that is. Uh, just imagery there. It's like the garden of Eden in front of that, that army. Beautiful. The land is gorgeous. But as that army comes through and annihilates everything in its path, it is nothing but barren wilderness behind it. Desert. It's as if everything is gone. The appearance of them as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, they shall leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devours the stubble, as a strong people set in battle array, before their face, the people shall be much pained. 
all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. When you read through and you read of how the wording here of how God's going to bring judgment in this great army that he's talking about that's going to come through and wipe out everything before it. When you read the descriptions of the army, it's really like the only thing we could kind of picture would be something you would see in some movie, something pretend and fake. Here's this huge, great army, and all they're doing is marching, and they're wiping out everything in front of them. Nothing stands. There's no reason they push, you know, another soldier out of the way to, to, break, to break rank, like it says. They just keep going. Houses don't stop them. Mountains don't stop them. Nothing stops them. They just keep moving and annihilating everything in their path. It's insane. Destruction is coming. And God is letting them know ahead of time, destruction will come. And he is even the one in charge and the one allowing this great destruction to come. It says in verse 10, the earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army for his camp is very great. For he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Wow. Joel is prophesying to the people, hey, there's a day coming. No joke. This day, although you can't imagine it or fathom this army or an army to this uh, uh, size and magnitude coming through and just wiping out everything in its path and nothing being able to stop them. Joel is saying, even though there's this great magnitude coming through, it's going to wipe them out. Hey, God is going to be doing this. God is going to accomplish this. And although we can't understand it, it's not a fairy tale. God's judgment upon this, upon people is serious and it's real. Why is there this judgment? Why would God do this? I thought God loved the world. He loves the world very much. The whole reason he has to throw out this judgment is because of our sin. Because of our hatred for him. How many times do we read of something to this effect of God's, serious toward, God's seriousness toward sin, and yet we say, wow, that's pretty serious, but I'm going to keep my sin. Didn't, didn't you just read? God is serious about sin. He's going to annihilate all these things because of sin, because of rebellion. But yet people in their arrogance will turn and say, I'm good. I'd rather have my pleasures. God is serious in bringing down judgment upon sin. And he loved us enough to put that judgment on his own son. So we stand back and say, well, how could this great God of wrath love me? Because he was willing to take that wrath upon himself. He was willing to take his own wrath for us. And so here God pronouncing this judgment and describing a day that is great and terrible. And then Joel comes through with this question then who can stand, right? Who can abide it? Who can stand it? This day is coming of judgment, then who is going to be able to stand against this? Wow. Judgment's great. The day of the Lord. So what should our response be? What should our response be to the fact 
that God will bring forth judgment upon sin. Well, thankfully, we don't have to come up with a guess or try to figure it out on our own. We just start reading the next verse. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. What's our response to be? Our response, what are we supposed to do? Return. God says, return. Turn back to me. Here's all this judgment coming down, but I want you to return to me. That is the response God wants us to have. Return. Turn back. Turning back implies we're going against God. We've already started going our own way. We're doing what we wanted to do. And so God is saying, here's what you should do. Here's the response you need to have. Turn back to me. Come back to me. Well then, when should we do it? Should we try to wait until we get really close, until judgment comes? Should we wait and see if our troubles kind of go away on their own? Should we wait until we've lived our life as a, as a young teen, young college-age person maybe? Should I wait till I live my, my youthful days of pleasure before I turn back to God? He says what? Therefore also now. Now, turn now to me. Not in the future, not another day, now. Our response is to be turned back to God, and we're to do it now. He makes it very clear as well on how we're supposed to turn back to him. He says, turn unto the Lord your God with all of your heart. God is not looking for a half-hearted turning back to him. He's not looking for us to say, all right, God, so I'm going to turn back to you now because there's obviously some problems going on in our world. So uh, seems like a good time to kind of be on your side. I, uh, you know, we, we kind of treat God sometimes as like a uh, Almost like a rabbit foot. I don't know. Do people know what rabbit's foot are right? with the different cultures? Like a good luck charm, right? We treat God like a good luck charm. Like if I have if I have God with me right now, um, <laughs> then then hopefully I won't get sick. Uh, hopefully my family won't get sick because, you know, I got God. I know some people um, may carry around little religious pictures in their pockets. And they say, well, I always... I always have God with me. I have Jesus right here on this picture. I have him with me in my pocket, so we're good. And we treat God as if, um, you know, only, only to help my problems. God's not looking for a half-hearted turning back to him. He wants our whole heart. I want all of your heart. I want you to turn back to me now. But I want all of you. I don't want just some of you. I want all of your heart. God is not interested in the motives. Just motives and externals only. The externals come with the heart. So God wants the heart. You know, he says, turn back with all your heart and with fasting and mourning and weeping. The fasting is to be serious in turning back to God. A lot of times people, whether religious reasons or whatever, they fast. Some people do it for dieting, you know, and you might lose your, your two pounds and uh, your blood sugar drops. The next week it's up like four pounds, but you lost your two, and that's what you're going to talk about. But that's not what God's talking about, fasting for dieting. That's not what it is. It's not a purpose of losing weight. 
There are some religions out there that fast often. Maybe somebody thinks they're very religious, very close to God, and they fast a couple times a week. Maybe they fast uh, on certain holidays. But God is not looking for a fasting where people do it in order to to gain some favor before God. Oh, God is going to be more impressed with me because I've given up food for two weeks. So he's going to love me more because of this. That's not what God wants. Why? Because he wants all the heart. He's not interested in just those external uh, actions that people take place and do. He wants their heart. So this fasting, this weeping, this mourning, it's a realization of the fact that who God is and who I am as a sinner, I need to turn back to God. I am so full of sin. And there's weeping, there's mourning, there's a realization of how evil I am and that I need God. Well, there's good news here. In turning back to God and rending our hearts and not just once again our garments, just an external show. There's great news and encouragement. The one calling out, saying, hey, there's going to be judgment, but return to me. That one then reveals some great characteristics of himself. He says, turn back to me, and here's why. Because I'm gracious. I'm compassionate. I'm slow to anger. I'm abounding in loving kindness. He even relents of evil. Relents of the judgment that was going to be poured out. God was, God loves us so much. That here he is saying, I have to punish sin, but turn back to me. I'm ready to forgive. I'm so looking forward to forgiving you right now. I want to forgive you. I want you to come to me. I'm calling out to you. Turn to me. Turn to me. Here I am. That doesn't at all sound like someone you want to be afraid of to ask their forgiveness. I know uh, one time at work, I had been asked to do something and to make sure it happened. Got it. No problem. No problem. We can take care of that. And uh, this, this was actually a task that would generate more revenue for the company. So I just had to make sure it, it got going and everything was fine. I did not follow up to make sure that it was done by, by the other departments. So uh, we did not make that revenue as we were supposed to have. And so uh, I found out later and uh, got nervous because I would have to go to my boss and say, hey, by the way, um, we didn't get all that money that we thought we were going to get. And it's my fault. Now, I wasn't looking forward to that conversation because how would I know how my boss is going to respond? We have some good news right here. We already know how God is going to respond even before we turn to him for forgiveness. God lets us know up front, my door is open, come in, I'm ready to forgive you. That's awesome. Then why do we oftentimes cower in fear, afraid of what God might do, if we come to confess? As if he doesn't know we sinned until we confess. He's fully aware. The confession is for us to get it right with him. Not for us to tell him about it. It's not like we're letting him in on a secret. But God is there, ready, arms wide open. Come back. Come back to me. I'm here. 
I'm ready to forgive, like a dad. You have a little kid who's done wrong and you had to correct them? And they're a little afraid? What do you do? You open your arms? They might run to you, jump in your arms, and you just squeeze them and cuddle them. And they know, I'm all good with dad now. It's all taken care of. That's God. What compassion he has. So, during our time in this situation, our current situation, really not just for now, but for the rest of our lives, it's time to turn back to God. It's time to seek Him and look for Him, not just to get rid of my problem, but to get Him. To seek Him with all my heart. For He is the one that's gracious, compassionate, and ready to forgive me. Let's pray. God, we thank You very much for Your truth. And we thank You very much for calling us to Yourself to turn back to You. To repent of our sin and to get it right with You. Thank You so much for Your desire to forgive, for you are gracious and compassionate. In Jesus' name, amen.